Today from the Global Lane, elections and the government in Canada, compromised by communist China, the danger to America's northern neighbor and the United States. Canada has become a CCP client state, and I think this is of grave concern. Overcoming growing anti-Semitism through the Holocaust, an Auschwitz survivor meets the son and grandson of the death camp commandant. It's a story set in the past, which is so relevant for the present. And as our film shows, it also leads into the future. There's a message of hope. A story of reconciliation and forgiveness. And nearly 80 years after the camp was liberated, an emotional visit by the son and grandson of Rudolf Hess. Who wants to have Rudolf Hess as his grandfather, right? The greatest mass murder in human history. And it's all right here on the Global Lane. Tipping the scales away from free and fair elections and influencing North American governments. We've already told you how the Chinese Communist Party has influenced political decisions in Washington. But now there are new allegations that they've compromised elections and the government in Canada. Our next guest believes more is on the horizon for the United States. Leighton Gray, host of the Gray Matter podcast, is here to explain from Alberta, Canada. Leighton, good to have you with us. So this spring, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service reported that the Chinese Communist Party interfered in the past two Canadian elections. So what did they do? Well, uh, what I would say to your viewers and listeners is imagine if everything that Hillary Clinton said about Donald Trump in 2016 were actually true. That's the situation in Canada. It, there's very clear evidence that the CCP has interfered and infiltrated many of Canada's institutions. And most recently, in our last two national elections in 2019 and 2021, uh, Incidentally, in both of those cases, Barack Obama endorsed Justin Trudeau, called him a friend of democracy. There may be a connection there. But what we're experiencing right now in Canada very clearly is under Justin Trudeau's leadership, Canada has become a CCP client state. And I think this is of grave concern or should be of grave concern not only to Canadians, but to the domestic geopolitical uh, you know, structures and security of the United States. And uh, you know, just recently, in, in past days, there have been questions from U.S. Congress of Justin Trudeau about infiltration of a lab, the, the top microbiology lab in Canada, in, in the city of Winnipeg, uh, had, has, was infiltrated by the Chinese. And the U.S. Congress wrote a letter asking questions about that. And what's worse is we're seeing in Canada cover-ups of investigations that have been trying to get to the bottom of this. And of course, uh, a trio of U U U.S. lawmakers recently condemned Justin Trudeau for what he did during the Freedom Convoy when he froze people's bank accounts. So there's a lot of CCP influence going on in Canada. And the concern is that it, it really is a threat it's because Canada's proximity to the U.S. It's a threat to U.S. hegemony and essentially Western hegemony because those of us in Canada and the West should all realize that without the, the broad shoulders of America standing there to defend freedom, we're all in, in, in a very, very desperate situation. Well, as you mentioned, these allegations go well beyond just election interference. You mm -hmm. and other Canadians allege the CCP has compromised the integrity of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government beyond the uh, lab. So explain where else. Well, uh, my, my view, and, I, and this is backed up by, by many uh, experts in this area, including Brandon Weikert, who is an American uh, geopolitical expert who I've had on my show, and, and his view, which I, which I happen to agree with, is that the World Economic Forum, the UN Agenda 2030, and even the World Health Organization are really just fronts for the CCP, and these are really clandestine attacks upon U.S. hegemony. So what we're seeing in Canada is that our federal government is, is enacting policies that are coming forth through the World Economic Forum and these other agencies, but are really originating in the CCP. And we've even had a situation in Canada where one of our Air Force bases in a city called Red Deer, which is a city of about 100,000 people, uh, which is between Edmonton and Calgary in the province of Alberta, was actually being used by the Chinese to train their own pilots. So uh, there's very serious concern in our country about deep infiltration, not only of our political structures, but also of our of our culture. And of course, this has deep uh, you know manifestations. We're having similar problems in Canada with migrants, only in Canada it's worse. 
because the because the governor of Canada is actually paying to fly these people here, as opposed to them, you know, flooding the southern border in the U.S. Our government is actually flying them here from from third world countries and putting them up in hotels at the expense of Canadian taxpayers. It's having very serious impacts upon all of our social welfare systems, from healthcare to our political structures, our schools, our universities. Uh, so very very deep concerns about the destruction of of Western culture really in Canada and throughout the Western world. Okay, what about here in the U.S.? What do you see happening uh, here in the USA and how has the CCP uh, infiltrated our gov government or compromised it? We've told people about some of this. Mm -hmm. So do you think uh, Joe Biden is compromised and if so, how? I, I do, and I, I think what you're seeing, I'll, I'll just use one example, the, the, the World Health Organization Pandemic Treaty, which, uh, which Joe Biden and Justin Trudeau were ready to sign on to. Uh, we shouldn't think that these globalists are going to end there. Uh, you know, one candidate for the U.S. presidency, Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, said not jokingly uh, during his campaign that perhaps the U.S. should be thinking about erecting a northern wall to protect them from Canada. We have the longest undefended border in the world. And I think that um, if Donald Trump is elected in the United States, I think he's going to take a great deal more interest in the domestic security threat that Canada poses, given our close relationship with Chinese uh, to, to the United States, than certainly than, than the Biden administration has taken in recent years. Okay, from Alberta, Canada, Leighton Gray, host of the Gray Matter podcast. Thank you, Leighton, for sharing those insights. We appreciate it. Thank you. Overcoming modern-day anti-Semitism through the testimonies of two families who lived through the horrors of the Holocaust. A new documentary film shares the story of an Auschwitz survivor and the son and grandson of the Commandant who oversaw the death camp. Well, joining us is Daniela Volker, the director of the film, The Commandant's Shadow, and the grandson of Rudolf Hess, Kai Hess. Daniela, the timing of the release of this film is remarkable given the recent rise of uh, anti-Semitism worldwide. So I'm sure it took years to put all of this together. So why were you determined to direct it? I thought it was a very important story to tell even before, you know, the events of the last six or seven months because um, anti-Semitism and hatred and othering in general is is something that wasn't confined to one particular period in history. And um, when I first came across uh, the subject, so initially I was contacted by uh, the daughter of Anita Laskavalfish, an Auschwitz survivor, Maya Laskavalfish, who was interested in sharing her experiences of transgenerational trauma. And I started looking into the subject. I came across the autobiography of Rudolf Hess, which is an extraordinary document um, written by uh, a perpetrator who was also a prime witness. And then I came across Kai and his father. And you suddenly realize that it's, it's a story set in the past, which is so relevant for the present. And as our film shows, it also leads into the future. There's a message of hope as both sides come together. So I guess I wanted to, in a way, bring something good into the world, a positive message. Kai, you're the grandson of Rudolf Hess, the commandant of the Auschwitz death camp, and you're also a pastor in Stuttgart. So in the film, you talk about generational curses and the evil your grandfather inflicted on the Jews. And you talk about Exodus 20, the iniquities of the sins of the fathers, are visited on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So how have you overcome the curse and the guilt? Until I, uh, you know, as Christian, he would say, until I got saved in, in, in Singapore in 1989, um, and that's another story, but my salvation story, how I met Christ and how I changed, how my life changed. And, uh, and that's when I started looking at the Bible and reading the Bible, especially the Old Testament. And I saw God's beloved people, the Jews, and uh, how, how God had, had called Abraham and how he had created his nation. And, and more and more, I realized that um, me being a Christian, I'm connected. Uh, I, I'm connected to, you know, to the children of Israel, through Abraham, through my, my faith in the Jewish Messiah. And, and I saw my, my background, and I, I felt this is an, an incredible opportunity to, to go to these people and say, look, guys, I love you. 
And I, I, you know, I don't think at all like my grandfather did. And I think what he did was, hor you know, horrific. And uh, I, you know, I want to, I want to just apologize on his behalf. I know he died. He's gone. He was, he was executed for his crimes. But I, I want to tell you, I love you guys. And and whatever, I, if I could turn the clock back, I would. But what can I do, right? And so, yeah. And, and um, it, it it changed my my total understanding of 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 the the children of Israel, the the people of Israel, Jews. And um, and at the end of the day, I realized too, we are all God's creation. Uh, we ought to all love each other and 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 have compassion for one another. And so, I, and I just realized this is a human problem that we have, and we can overcome that by love and, and grace. Well, also in the film, Kai, at a men's breakfast Bible study, you mentioned, "quote All of us have the propensity to go into a direction that is totally wrong." Right. So, with this current rise of anti-Semitism, we're seeing on American college campuses in Europe, elsewhere. How concerned are you that there could be another Holocaust and the evil and horrors of the death camps would return? I'm very concerned, and I think it's very important that governments, uh, you know, authorities step up and, and not just quell, but explain. Go out there with the – give give explanations and teach people. And I think that's what the commandant's shadow, and that's why I'm so thankful also to Daniela that she – that she she channeled this and she put it in the right direction and and that 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 documentary shows this hope that is possible in mean, reconciliation that is possible and and it, you know when I went to that that house uh, Anita's home it was it was it was the most wonderful experience to embrace a lady that had suffered at the hands of my my grandfather and I think that story that message can be put forward you know held forth to these people that are demonstrating, these people who have a mission based on an emotion that want to, that want to hurt, that want to get back, that want to get even, that they want to see that, that they're angry. Hey guys, look, this is what happens from anger to hatred, from hatred to war to to bloodshed. Let's stop this and talk. And I think the movie shows this, and Anita makes this point, I think, very eloquently uh, and, and very clearly, you know, in the movie. I think on several several points, she just says it very clearly. We need to we need to forgive. We need to forget. We need to work together. We need to look forward what we can do to have peace and to love one another. And I think it's possible. So yeah. I think well, your question, yes, I think if, if people don't come up with the right strategies and, and the the right, and it has to be driven by a heart that is willing to change things. Yeah, there has to be commitment to explain things. And I think if that doesn't happen, yes, this could spin out of control. Definitely. Yeah. Daniela, uh, you feature the story of Anita Lasker of uh, Wolfish in the, in the film. She survived Auschwitz because she was part of the camp band, a cello player, but she witnessed the gassings, the killings, her parents were murdered. How has she overcome that experience? What, uh, what about that pain? How did she overcome that? What did you learn from her story? Well, it's interesting because what I did learn is that Anita, like many other survivors, is incredibly tough. So I think in 1945, um, you know, there was a choice to make. You can either be broken by what you survived and the guilt of having survived, or you can just sort of pull the blinds down and look ahead. And I think for 50 years, that is what she did. And it's also what... I guess her daughter, to some extent, thinks she suffered from because um, a, t a sort of silence descended. So her daughter wasn't aware of what had happened to her mother, why she had no grandparents. And I think, you know, as we see in very many difficult families of situations, silence can be toxic. So I think it was really only at the uh, point when it was the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz that Anita first started talking and, you know, she then became, uh, I guess, Holocaust educator, you know, a campaigner in um, her retirement from being a cellist at the English Chamber Orchestra. So it's a remarkable career, but um, it's interesting that there needed to be five decades of something else. Up next, more of the Commandant's shadow and an emotional son and grandson visit to Auschwitz, remembering the evil of Rudolf Hess and how Kai Hess overcame the guilt of a grandfather who was the worst mass murderer in history. More now with Daniela Volker and Kai Hess and the documentary film, The Commandant's Shadow.
80 years after your grandfather, Kai, uh, oversaw Auschwitz, you returned there with your elderly father. So what was that experience like for you and for him? Uh, well, for, I want to talk about my own experience first. I, I was heartbroken. Uh, I, I remember that whole week. We had, uh, you know, reading the explanations, the narration, uh, listening to our tour guide, and just, you know, being immersed in this environment. This, you just imagine what happened on those platforms where people were separated left, right, left, right. And those that went left, you know, half an hour, an hour later, they were, they were gassed. Uh, children, women, pregnant women, the elderly. Uh, and I, I have children of my own. I have four children. Can you imagine your, your children being separated from you? The trauma they go through that very moment when they, they're so scared. And, and how did how heartless those, you know, my, my grandfather, how he conceived this entire system, uh, you know, to exterminate millions of people and making it more efficient. Did he have a heart? It, it just broke me. Uh, I, I spent that whole week I, I, repeatedly. I just... I was just sobbing. Um, at the same time, it gave me more of a resolve. It, you know, it, it created a, a much stronger resolve in me to stand up for for what happened there because it is undeniable. And there is clear, my grandfather's, Daniela mentioned earlier, his memoirs, if you want to call it that, he wrote this down. There, there's, a, there's a detailed report of what he did. Uh, and that he was instructed by Himmler and, uh, you know, and, and, the, and the, the leaders of, of the Nazi regime uh, to carry that out. And he was the willing tool in their hand to do it, in their hands to do it. And that is a, it's a written, it's there, it's proof. And so that gave me a much greater resolve. Now, coming to my daddy, I think, I think he was very much pricked in his heart. Uh, when he stood, and especially I saw his face, I, I remember looking at him from the side as he stood there, with his little stroller, and he was like looking at the gallows. And I just think you have to put yourself in his shoes. This is your dad, who actually was, ex you know, you know, executed on the sa very same gallows. And I, it, I know it broke his heart at the same time. But he, he told me, and he also says it. He, he feels very sad and heartbroken about what his own father did. Although his own father never, uh, he, his recollection is that his dad never talked about it. Rudolf Huss never talked about his work at home. He was shielded from it, and it's very clear in the, uh, in the film, the contrast between his life and what was happening in Auschwitz. So, Kai, right. if, if you were not a Christian, Kai, how could you ever overcome all this knowing your grandfather was the worst mass murderer in history? What difference has your faith made in this? Well, you know, with... And if someone understands how 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 it works with regards to redemption, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he died on the cross for the sins of the whole world. Yeah. And it's by the grace of God that I'm safe because the penalty I would receive, even that transgenerational, uh, the, the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation, you talked about at the beginning, that curse is, is real. Uh, for unrepentant sinners. And when people have that in a family, quite often sin is condoned. And they say, no, it was right that we did this sin or they suppress it like it was in my family, but that sin is not gone. And the only one that can atone, that has atoned for that is Jesus Christ. Simply by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, plus nothing. I didn't go into this and say, well, I need to somehow find a way to feel better about myself. And I think religion is the way to go. No, I didn't find a religion. I found the relationship with the living God. I mean, I'm a Gentile saved by a Jewish Messiah. Finally, Daniela, what are you hoping people will leave the theater knowing and feeling? What's the takeaway? Well, I hope people will remember, first of all, what happened, because it was the first and biggest, really, <clears throat> instance of industrialized killing of a people. But I also hope that they will understand, you know, that past actions have repercussions in the present. It's like shock waves going down the generations. And that can happen in any post-conflict situation. And also that there is hope for the future. You know, if a woman who survived, as she says, the hell of Auschwitz has it in her to meet the son of the commandant in her own house, surrounded by the pictures of her dead, her parents killed by the Nazis, 
that is, I think, a very powerful message. You know, it's it shows us that there is some hope. And as Anita herself says, you know, we really have to talk to each other. You know, dialogue is the future. The film is The Commandant's Shadow. Daniela Volker and Kai Hess, thank you for sharing this remarkable film with us. We thank appreciate you. it. Thank you so much. Members of the World Health Assembly gathering in Geneva have rejected a proposed agreement that many people believe would have undermined the sovereignty of nations. The idea was to give the World Health Organization additional authority to respond globally in the event of another COVID-19-like pandemic. Well, early last year, when this proposal, which, by the way, is a treaty, first came up, I spoke with Reggie Littlejohn, president of Women's Rights Without Frontiers and co-chair of the Stop Vaccine Passport Task Force. I asked what approval of the proposal would mean for people worldwide. I believe that it will mean the establishment of a, a worldwide totalitarian biotech state. It gives the WHO authority over the global supply chain, trade, commerce, uh, through establishment of the WHO Global Pandemic Supply Chain and Logistics Network. WHO Director, uh, Director General uh, Tedros would lead that effort early on in the pandemic. You remember Tedros praised President Xi Jinping for China's efforts to control the outbreak. So your thoughts on him and his potential control of the supply chain. Well, uh, T Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus is very closely aligned with the Chinese Communist Party, and the Chinese Communist Party has absolutely outsized uh, influence at the World Health Organization, uh, which is why they were able to get away with all the lies that they did, which were just amplified by uh, Dr. Tedros. So this is, uh, is not a good alliance at all. And in terms of the supply chains, they, they are also wanting to take um, control over the intellectual property. Like if somebody in the United States or another country develops a great vaccine, they're, they're going to be forced to share that information. So continue to keep your eyes and ears open on this one. Attempts will be made to revive it. Like Russia's Grigory Rasputin, this may be the treaty that will never die. Well, that's it from the Global Lane. Be sure to follow us on the CBN News and NRB channels, YouTube, iTunes, and our broadcast affiliates. And until next time, be blessed.